Good evening, and thank you for attending today's candidate forum featuring candidates running for Barrington Area Library Trustee. My name is Kathy Cortez, and I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of the Palatine Area, which includes Barrington and the surrounding Barrington communities. As you may know, the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization, and we do not support, oppose, or recommend any candidate for office. Any viewpoint voiced by the candidates are theirs alone. The League does not fact check during a, a forum. To ensure that today's questions for the forum represented a balance of issues, we solicited topics from the candidates and from the community at large. Questions for today's forums were prepared in advance and we prioritized them based on the feedback we got. They were vetted by a bipartisan team of League members and questions that were deemed to be negative or targeted to a certain individual candidate were eliminated. Because questions were prepared in advance, we're not gonna be taking questions from the audience today. Chat and raised hands features uh, have been disabled, so uh, we won't be doing that. Audience members will be muted, and we ask you to please stay muted. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's forum, Lori Bergner. Lori's a longtime member of the League of Women Voters of McLean County. And for those of you that don't know where that is, that's in the Bloomington Normal area. She currently directs their uh, local education programs. And she's he had many roles over the years, including serving twice as their local president. She's also moderated other candidate forums and uh, other educational programs that the League offers. And in her professional life, she's a clinical psychologist in private practice. So we're very fortunate that she's with us tonight. And Lori, with that, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Good evening. It's my pleasure to be with you this evening to moderate this candidate forum. As a resident of McLean County, I'm not eligible to vote in this election. So I've been asked to serve as an impartial facilitator for this discussion as a volunteer with the League of Women Voters. Let me take a few minutes to explain the format and the rules for the forum. All of the candidates were contacted by email and have agreed to abide by the ground rules provided by the League of Women Voters. They are as follows. Candidates have been placed in a random order. The moderator, which is me, will rotate this order during the forum for questions. Each candidate will have one minute for their opening statement. And then next, each candidate will have one minute to answer each question. The moderator will repeat the question if necessary. If needed, a rebuttal may be requested and each candidate will have a maximum of two rebuttals during the entire hour and a half. Rebuttals will be timed and limited to 30 seconds each. And then at the very end, each candidate will have a one minute closing statement. Our timer for today, timers are Stan and Diane Sanderson and we thank them. So candidates will be given a 30 second and then a 15 second warning. So please quickly complete your thoughts before you see the stop card. Time limits will be enforced out of respect for all candidates. Questions have been solicited from audience members at the time of registration. Each question will be answered by all of the candidates. Questions have been reviewed for bias, clarity, appropriateness, and to avoid duplication. Candidates have been asked to treat each other with respect and not to interrupt one another. Candidates who do not comply with these rules and time limits may be muted and the moderator will move to the next question or candidate. Today's forum will be taped for League of Women Voters use in educating the public. A video of this forum will be available early next week on the League of Women Voters of the Palatine area website and the candidates have agreed to this. No campaign signs, buttons or partisan materials may be visible on screen. No voice image or other duplication of the forum may be used by a candidate's representative or campaign in any campaign advertising. The League of Women Voters claims copyright ownership of all recordings or transcript produced from this event and reserves the right to publicize this forum. Today, we will hear from candidates running for Barrington Area Library Trustee. We have six candidates who are vying for three seats. With us today and on the ballot are Chase Heidner, Rachel Forsyth Turk, Kristen Cunningham, Lindsay Priggy, Kelly Dittman, and Jackie McGrath. I want to thank you all for your participation. 
And um, I hope you will all uh, be okay with me referring to each of the candidates by first names for brevity's sake, even though it's a little bit informal, but you'll know who they are. So uh, we are going to begin with the one minute opening statements and by prior agreement, Chase Heidner will go first. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. I just want to say thank you for holding this forum. It's a great opportunity for voters to compare and contrast candidates who are looking to represent us at the Barrington Area Library. Uh, my name is Chase Heidner, and I'm running for library trustee along with Kristen Cunningham and Kelly Dittman. A little about me is that I was born and raised here in Barrington, where I attended Grove Avenue Elementary, Station Middle School, and Barrington High School. And I'm essentially running for library because I'm looking to serve and to give back to the community that has given so much to me my entire life. Uh, some of the main reasons of focus for our library is that we want to ensure that our library is a warm and welcoming environment for all community members of all ages and all walks of life. I want to be able to drive library resources that, that fulfill community members' wants, needs, and values. And I want to promote fiscal responsibility and transparency. I believe a strong, resourceful library is one of the foundations of a strong community. I hope to not only I hope to not only make the library stronger, but our community as well by bringing us all together at the library. Thank you. Okay, Rachel Forsyth Turk, you're next. Hi, my name is Rachel Forsyth Turk and I'd like to introduce myself. I worked in marketing for financial services companies for several years while earning my MBA from Northeastern University in Boston. I became a stay-at-home mom with two little boys in 2005, and that's when I quickly discovered that my sleepy local library in suburban Boston was a lifeline. To help energize that library, I became an elected library trustee for two terms. Uh, when we moved here in 2015, now with three kids in tow, an energetic active library was an important draw for me. As soon as my kids saw the slide in the kids area, I knew we had made the right choice. Since moving here, I've been active in many volunteer roles in the community, such as PTOs at St. Anne's, Lines, Station, BHS, as well as soccer, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Be Strong Together. Uh, but now I'm hoping to apply my experience as a library trustee in Massachusetts by helping to ensure that our library here remains energetic and active and provides a destination for other libraries considering Barrington as a place to live. Thank you very much, Rachel. Kristen Cunningham, you're next. Hi, um, good evening. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for holding this forum. Um, I'm Kristen Cunningham, a candidate for the six-year term on the Barrington Area Library Board. I am an avid reader. Um, my family and I have experienced the value of so many of the library's resources and programs. Um, then as a trustee, I will strongly advocate for the library usage to everyone throughout the district. As a former business manager for several large cosmetic companies, I've experienced promoting businesses through partnerships and events while managing goals and growth and client retention. I will use both my professional experience and learned knowledge to benefit the library by maximizing patron usage and increasing investments in new technology and resources. I truly love our library and everything it offers, which is why I wanna be a part of shaping its future. Thank you very much. Lindsay Priggy, you're next. So growing up, my favorite pastime was getting lost in a good book. Library day at school was the highlight of my week and the annual book fair was better than any Christmas morning. Libraries are more than just books. They offer a quiet study place for teens after school, 3D printing for the college kid who is home over summer break and wants to try something that he saw on TikTok and seminars for checking in on your life documents for the newly retired. Programs like Lego Club for budding young future architects, take and make kits for family weekend time, and a, just a change of scenery for the new parent who's looking to escape the house. With over 10 years of industry experience in the financial world, and as a parent of three kids and three dogs, I am the perfect addition of knowledge, leadership, and advocacy to the Barrington Area Library. As a voice for all in our community district, I will promote responsible money management, expansion of services, and preserve open access to information. Thank you so much for hosting. Thank you. Okay, Kelly Dittman. You bet. Thank you so much for hosting League of Women Voters, Lori, Kathy, bringing us all together. 
Kelly Dittman, proud to be running for the two-year library board seat for the uh, Barrington Library as trustee. Uh, my husband, Bob, and I, we moved back to Illinois just a few years ago, and it's an absolute pleasure. We're very involved in the community, acting as uh, advisory board within St. Anne's on the Environmental Park Commission with the Village of North Barrington. Uh, in a professional capacity, I lead our ESG sustainability work for an international conglomerate and do quite a bit of traveling these days. Um, but my passion is really around education, education, education. I've sat on several boards across the United States for both nonprofit and philanthropic efforts and for profit. And the library is one of our best kept assets here in our backyard. So it's an absolute pleasure to be running for your two year seat. Uh, and thank you for your consideration. All right, okay. last opening statement, we're on to Jackie McGrath. Hi. I'm Jackie McGrath, and during my teaching career, I worked as a primary classroom teacher, special ed teacher, and reading specialist. I spent my career dedicated to not only teaching children how to read, but to love reading. I believe my career aligns perfectly with this part of the Barrington Area Library mission statement, to foster lifelong learning and create young readers. I also have experience serving on six boards, one being as an elected library board trustee and another as uh, president of the Friends of the Library. I'm running in the April 4th election because I'm concerned about the future of the Barrington Area Library. Currently, there is a nationwide movement to cut budgets and ban books. Unfortunately, these efforts are intensifying, as well as efforts to change policies regarding book removal and the purchasing of new materials. This movement is being spearheaded by organizations that want to control what people have access to. Who sits on the board can mean the difference between a thriving library and one that is being dismantled. Thank you very much. And I wanna let everyone know if you wanna see only the candidates and uh, timers, uh, you can change your view. If you have everybody else on, you don't wanna see it, go up to view and just put a uh, gallery view on and you will see uh, just fewer people and you'll see them bigger. Okay, so the first question, we are gonna start with Rachel. The first question is, what was the driving force behind your decision to run for library trustee and what do you hope to accomplish? Rachel. Sure. Well, I've been a library advocate for the past 18 years. It's I have it's not a fleeting thing. Uh, so I've been very uh, active with with the library as far as uh, when I was in Denham, Massachusetts, I helped start a Denham Library Innovation Team, which was designed to be a little bit more active and get more community involvement. Um, so I, I'm, just, I'm very passionate about our local library. Uh, I have to say, I was concerned this past summer, listening to a lot of meetings at the Board of Education meetings. There were a lot of people who have been talking about banning books and I'm for the freedom to read. And I thought maybe we just to make sure that uh, we have somebody on the library trustee who's for advocating for the freedom to read. And that's why I decided to run. All right, Kristen, you're next. Um, well, I've always loved the library. Um, I read books all the time. I like the Maker Lab. Um, I use a lot of the apps. I think I really, really got into the library a couple of years ago after I had a surgery and um, people had to take care of my kids for me. And without the library, I just don't even know what I would do. Um, my kids were there all the time, thankfully, and I could read and I had that basically access to everything I love. So I appreciate it. And I just want to give back and be a part of it. Okay, Lindsay. Can you repeat the question for me, please? Sure. Thank you. What was the driving force behind your decision to run for library trustee? And what do you hope to accomplish? Thank you. First and foremost, my kids, our community. We moved to Barrington in 2019 and I was pregnant with our third child. We very shortly after I had given birth, uh, shut down due to the pandemic and without the resources like the library, oh man, at home with three kids is really tough when uh, you cannot, necessarily go out uh, into the world. So we used a lot of the apps that the library provides. We were able to safely go back into the library and use some of the kids services. The pickup in the parking lot was essential. 
And so I am hoping to expand a lot of those services that we gained through COVID, like parking lot pickup, uh, sending seniors who are homebound books and other services like that. All right, Kelly Dittman. You bet, thanks, Lori. Very passionate about an opportunity to give back from a professional and board capacity. Um, as I've been doing research and spending time in the library, the investment, through, truly thrilled about the strategic planning process that's been, that's taken shape. Having the opportunity to work in a way, I think that Barrington Area Library has already done an exceptional job in advancing investment. I think we're at an, a unique opportunity now to create an environment for online learning for all ages, to really explore ways of innovation, creating, uh, the past director talked extensively around creating a library of things, a library of the future, connected with smart devices, creating platforms, intellectual literary, and ultimately driving that um, cross alignment across the region. So as, a, as an opportunity to give back as a strategist, it'll be a pleasure to spend time advancing some of the investment discussions and some of the strategic, strategic discussions as an investment for our community. Excellent, okay, Jackie McGrath. I, my driving force behind running really is my love of the library and my belief that is it really is the heart of the community. And especially during COVID, um, for especially for seniors that had no opportunity to, you know, engage with other people whatsoever. I mean, even being able to go to the library and access material and have it delivered to my car safely, that was incredible for me. You know, I've been a lifelong reader and I've dedicated my life to teaching young children to read. So that was really, really important. And what do I... Uh, want to see for its future and why am I doing this? Well, I want to ensure its future and I want to ensure that it's accessible to everyone in our community from all walks of life with its wonderful resources that it has both, um, you know, hard copies of things and electronically, the facilities, the, um, it's just an amazing place to be and not for all ages. And I go there with my grandchildren and their you know, youth library and what a wonderful learning place for young minds. It's incredible, love it. And uh, Chase. So I just, first of all, I just love people, right? I love helping people. I studied psychology, which is all about people. And I, when I came back home, I was like, what better way to do it than to serve the community that has, like I said, given so much to me my entire life. So this is my way of giving back. Not only that, I also love research. Researching is my passion. You know, you go to the library to resource, uh, to research, you get resources from your library. And speaking of which, our library has so many resources. And one of the big things that I want to do is get people to be become aware of all of these resources. Even if so many people think when they hear the library, like, oh, I'm just going to go in and pick a book. But it's so much more. Even, even if you just want to read newspapers, you can access them for free through the apps. And getting people to become aware of these resources is really important for me and increasing engagement because everybody has an opportunity to gain something from the library. So engagement is a big one with me as well. Okay. Now we're on to question number two. And we will start with Kristen. This question is, please describe one or two strengths of which the library can be proud. So Kristen, you start. Um, one or two strengths that our library can be proud. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the access to some of the apps that we have are pretty amazing. I know my library back in Buffalo doesn't have the Mango app, which you can learn all the new languages on. Um, I kind of take that for granted. Uh, I love the Libby app. That's a strength. I just recently got into reading books on the go. Prior to the app, I was kind of more of a hard copy book person. Um, I think the 3D Maker Lab, the laser printer, um, the fact that we keep up to date with technology. Uh, there's a million things. The Seed Garden, I love. Um, just the librarians are great. They're all very knowledgeable and patient. Um, especially, you know, when you're using the Maker Lab and you're not sure exactly how to do things, um, they're very helpful. So a lot of great things that our library can be proud of. 
All right, Lindsay, you're next. There are two things that really come to mind. One is the newest edition that is open, uh, the mother's room. If you haven't been in there yet, it's right off of Children's Services. It is a phenomenal place for uh, mothers with small, small babies to go and nurse in private if they choose or to feed their babies in any other way. It has a just a quiet space away from some of the other library patrons and a changing space, just some really, um, just a really beautiful room to help support that section of our community. Another thing that I just love is the lockers that are at the train station. We have a community that is um, recently overturned. There's a lot of younger workers, people who access the train and to be able to make the library very much available 24 seven and not just during their business hours where people can retrieve items from the lockers at the train station, I think is really valuable and unique. Okay, thank you. Kelly? You bet. Well, to echo quite a few of my colleagues here, without question, I think the programming at the library is best in class. I have a, an eight-year-old son, William, who uh, when he gets home from St. Anne's, we start scouring and looking at all of the opportunities to get engaged between Lego time. Um, I think Kristen mentioned and Lindsay, the 3D um, CAD opportunities, STEM classes, of course, virtual story times. And then most recently, really impressed over the holiday season with, I believe it was the Elgin um, Symphony that was able to come together, just really right here in our backyard, an opportunity to engage. Um, I'm absolutely passionate, not only about the programming, but also as a fiduciary responsibility, again, as we mentioned before, driving investment, strategic planning, and then also advancing policy um, across um, the library um, trustee uh, organization. So it's just, it's a pleasure and much to be proud of. Okay, and Jackie? Well, I think our library is just incredible. It houses a collection of over 330,000 books, audio books, CDs, DVDs, audio and video downloads, and other items. It's absolutely incredible. And this is um, such a uh, connection to me because I've tried to develop lifelong learning in the students that I work with. And where else can you do that? But in the Barrington Area Library, you can do it uh, in, in comfort of your own home, and you all talked about the wonderful programs, and I've certainly taken advantage of many, many of them at home. I do cook with books. I listen to, you know, for me, how to, you know, use Libby or uh, Hula or whatever. And I go to the uh, Friday night concerts along with many, of uh, many, many other people um, in our community. And it's just been a joy and a pleasure to become a Barrington resident 10 years ago and to have the library as such an integral part of, of my life. I really do appreciate the library. Chase? Uh, yes, so something, two things that I think we should be proud of, especially for me, I love the apps. I love Press Re Reader and I love the New York Times that we have access to. I think it's huge that we can access these newspaper because otherwise they're expensive and, and so many people already pay for that subscription and don't know like, hey, you already paid through it with your taxes and taxes because it's available at the library. So I think that's huge. And that's why I want everybody to know about it. Um, another thing is I think the seed garden, I think that is a really fun way to get people to be actually interactive, to be physically involved with nature and, and learning how to grow. I recently just started a garden. So I'm definitely going to be going there for information on how to take care of my garden and why sometimes the leaves look white or this way, right? And just being able to take home seeds. And also I see a whole lot of potential that could also come from the seed garden. So, garden. so that's a, an exciting and proud thing, a proud something to be proud of. Thanks. Okay, and Rachel. Uh, everybody covered all, quite a lot and I agree with everything people said. But one of the things I also think we should really be proud of is our staff. We have just an amazing staff and we take it for granted. Uh, but without them, I don't know if, how we would have gotten through COVID. I mean, they were so creative and nimble and just really you know, put, put their thinking caps on and figure out a way to keep it open and keep it working. And the, the parking lot delivery was inspired 
Um, and then a lot of good things came out of it, like the virtual programs. Um, we didn't realize people were really hungry for those. And I don't think those are going away. So it's a good learning thing. They tried it and now we're going to keep those. And same thing with the outdoor programming. There's a big appetite for that. People are interested, like the, the seed garden and the outside garden. And I've enjoyed making garden stakes in the programs that they've had. So I just, I love the, what the, what the staff has done. And also like things like the, the browsing bundles. I don't know if people are aware of those. You can just call up and be like, I have a third grade kid reading at this level and I need help. And someone will come put together a book of bundles for you, a bundle to read, try out. It's amazing what our staff can do. Okay, excellent. Okay, now we're on to question number three. And this one will start with Lindsay. Which library board subcommittee will you ask to serve on? And what special skills would make your serving on the committee a good fit? So for me, the board committee that I would ask to serve on is the financial committee. I started my financial career as a part-time teller at a small credit union when I was going to college. And from there, I went through their manager program. I had the opportunity to move to our second largest uh, location and manage that, which was a very exciting branch. And I have done everything from a small local credit union to working at one of the largest financial institutions in our investing department uh, in the nation. And so I would love to be able to use that time that I spent in the financial industry to serve our local community and help continue the fabulous job that I think that our current board is doing with the budget. Great. Kelly, you're on. You bet. I echo Lindsay uh, in the fact that finance committee is where my heart would be. And then also, um, again, strategic planning, programming, at the end of the day, we're a team. So it's really important that we all lean in with our best competencies and skill sets. Personally, um, again, very education focused, went to Purdue for my undergrad, um, Drake University for MBA, and then uh, University of Chicago Booth for Advanced Strategy Economics. And when you think about, in addition to from an academic standpoint, also professionally work with CEOs across the board and helping to uh, inform their investment and finance strategy. So being a part of you know, our library board trustee to advance that would be, would be key. Thank you. And Jackie. Yes, well, given my background as an educator, I feel that um, the biggest contribution I could make is in the area of youth services and uh, strategic planning and the, uh, any way to um, enhance the programs that we have. And we do have wonderful programs in the library for um, children of all ages. Uh, but, you know, there might be a, other ways that we can uh, reach out to some of the underserved areas of our library district. We have one of the largest geographic libraries in the state. And we, although we do have a large number of uh, cardholders, we have about ha half of those residents are, are not cardholders. And there might be other ways that um, we can uh, serve them better in our community. So that's what I would be um, looking forward to doing and being part of strategic planning to be able to enhance those services to our underserved uh, residents. Okay, Chase, you're next. Uh, so I would like to sit on the long range planning committee and probably also the budget and finance committee since they, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, I studied uh, psychology at DePaul University. So I participated in many teams, I was in, uh, I worked in two research labs where we had to collaborate as a team and essentially a lot of it was you know creating team charters creating mission statements and then creating um goals and objectives that align with those mission state uh, mission statements so that we can complete what we set out to complete and that's all in the long range planning not only that i had the chance to talk to so many community members and like they all had so many ideas and so many wants and needs that they would like to see in our library. For example, I talked to folks over at um, uh, Greencastle and something that they wanna see back is like kind of like a bookmobile, for example, so that the elderly folks can actually have a chance to browse without having to the hassle to go to the library. So probably those two, thank you. All right, Rachel? 
So I, I reached out to a few current tri, uh, library trustees to ask about the different committees, and uh, the answers I got were it's it's basically everyone everyone shows up for everything. It's, uh, every, it's so everyone would be have a place on the long term strategy, and everyone just kind of does finance. Although the treasurer is like the chair of the finance policy committee or finance committee. Um, but with that being said, so I, I have some experience with the library trustee before, and one of the things I felt I was proud of doing was initiating a five-year strategic plan at our current library at our library for Massachusetts. And we didn't have one on file with the state of Massachusetts before, which meant we were unable to apply for certain grants. So I think it's really important that we have our ducks in a row for a strategic plan and it opens up other further funding opportunities. And I also sat on uh, other boards um, for like running clubs and uh, where it's much more of a membership mindset. So I had to have that marketing kind of how are we going to get the engagement? How are you going to attract people? That kind of mindset as well. And Kristen. Um, well, like Rachel said, I think everyone's involved in all aspects of the different um, parts of the board. I think I would be good at long-term strategic planning. I could also do finance because I've worked with budgets for most of my career before coming becoming a stay-at-home mom. Um, outreach and PR because I've had to develop relationships and networking and um, I'm talking to a lot of people I'm actually surprised there's a lot of people that really don't know a lot of the services the library offers so um, I mean I guess outreach would be huge for me because everyone should be enjoying all the things the library is offering okay we're ready for our next question and this one will start with Kelly. For how many years have you held a Barrington Library card and what library services have you used over the past year or so? So we moved back to Illinois in 2019 and before we purchased our home in North Barrington, uh, we were in the Deer Park area. And I remember explicitly looking at the different services between the parks district and the library. And so, um, uh, we researched upon moving back at that time, becoming members and as part of the experience. Uh, my son, William, the services that we love are ultimately helping to advance his work. Um, as I mentioned before, mostly the online and in-person uh, programming. Uh, we've gotten involved in the 3D club. We've gotten involved, or forgive me, the CAD work that he's done. Uh, the Lego, and then also um, we've gone just quite frankly there to, to study. And uh, I was sharing a story with some friends and family. Um, we are now on speed dial. We've got a, 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 a stack of books on our kitchen table that um, I'm not quite sure we can get through together as a family. <laughs> so we've been checking out quite a few physical books as of late. Okay, Jackie. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm an avid uh, library um, patron, and I am uh, use it for lots of different programs, especially I mentioned going to the Saturday night, I mean, Saturday night, Friday night concerts, and um, I'm excited about going to the one tomorrow night, tomorrow night, no, Friday night, sorry, and um, and we, I also go to, you know, there are other programs like they we had the Elgin's uh, Symphony Orchestra, you know, doing their little listening type of programs. I go to uh, Cook for Books. I'm involved in two of the book discussions. And um, I do interlibrary loans all the time because I'm an avid reader and I'm in, engaged in doing my own book discussions with the League of Women Voters. So I use it as a great resource for that as well. And um I do have um, grandchildren, as I mentioned, so we take great advantage of those programs, and they are fabulous, and especially on the days off of school and during the summertime. And um, so I'm there. I'm and you see me around all the time. I love the seed library. Whoa, that's really cool. <laughs> okay, Chase. Yes. Yeah, so as I said uh, in my intro, I was born and raised here, so I remember being taken to go get my first library card sometime in elementary school, right? So I, as of now, I'm just using it all the time mm -hmm. online at least once a day because I like to read the news. I do. I like to read newspapers and magazines. So I use Press Reader for that. And then when friends uh, recommend a book to me, Libby, just go see if it's available at least. Uh, and if not, 
But also, as I've just been researching so much about all of the resources in the library, I am planning on uh, doing some of the online learning because uh, they offer Gale courses. So you can like enroll and it's like a six week led by an expert instructor from like classes as simple as like beginning drawing all the way to like accounting and finance. So that is something I'm definitely going to take up on. Um, but yeah, there's just so much, so much going on at the library and I plan on fully indulging myself and my two-year-old niece that I will be dragging to sto story time as much as I possibly can, as long as my, my, my sister-in-law gives her up to me. <laughs> All right, Rachel. So I'm also an avid reader. And uh, when we first got here, it was one of the first stops that we went, got everybody a library card. I'm also a slow reader. So I'm really bad about returning my books on time, but I'm very good about taking them out. <laughs> so I take, take out a lot of books. A lot of ebooks. Um, my kids did a lot of playaways and audiobooks when we go on road trips. That's kind of our go to family thing that we can all kind of agree on. Um, we do the seed library, but also the virtual programming about how to do the seeds and all kinds of um, tips about winter sowing. Uh, X and my kids really like the Xbox and the Kids Play Center and also the green screen that's available. Uh, I've done the laser, center, laser cutter for garden stakes. And during COVID, I don't know what we would have done without uh, the library for my husband to come go and do like work, just actual work in a cubicle, because I, this is a, a nice office, but what you can't see it has three entrances and none of them are closed off. And we're in the center of the house. There's no, there's no privacy or quiet anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the things that we use most. All right, Kristen. Um, well, I use the Mango app every day. I was paying like $150 for Duolingo, so which I'm still paying, but um, it's nice to have the Mango app as well. Um, mm -hmm. I take out physical books as well as, um, you know, Rachel's recommended a couple of good books that I've gotten through Libby, so I appreciate that. Um, I was at the seed, well, not the seed garden, but the garden in fall, putting mulch for and seeding for the spring. Um, I was at the Maker Lab. I've got my mug, <laughs> the sublimations. I'm at the library or using the library a lot. Hopefully more once running for library trustees over, I feel like I'm not reading as much and I can't wait to get back to it. Right, Lindsay. I echo everybody. Oh my gosh, I think I practically live here some days. The meeting rooms have been fantastic for our Girl Scout meetings that I help lead, our PTO book club that I do for Lines Elementary. They have been great for uh, meeting up with fellow candidates for just some time together to say, hey, how's it going? And we've done the ebook and the Libby app is fantastic. I would highly suggest if you haven't read Spare yet uh, by Prince Harry, he actually reads it to you, which is fantastic. And at 1.3 speed, you can knock about five hours off the audiobook. So that is a fun tip if you've never just sped up your audiobook a little bit to get to it a little bit faster. But we have had a library card since we moved here in 2019, so about four years. And many, many, many more to come. All right. Next question. And I do want to remind you all that if you, none of you have used any rebuttals yet, but you can. Uh, so you can raise your hand. And if I don't see you, you can yell out if you decide at the end after everyone has, has answered quest the question. So next question will be uh, started with Jackie. Hmm. Does the library board have a role in selecting library books, publications, online materials, or programs? And if so, what is that role? Well, the, uh, the library uh, uh, board actually approves the budget and the uh, dollar amounts and line amounts that go for each one of those items. As far as actually doing the um, selection, their job is to hire the very best people that make those kinds of day-to-day -day decisions. So we rely on them. And there are board policies as to how the materials are considered and, and what kind of um, processes they have to be um, gone through to be um, uh, purchased for the library. And it's in their um, 
Barrington Area Library Board policy, and it's um, quite extensive and it's very well done. But um, it, that main uh, responsibility lies with the good people that they've hired. And I think the Barrington Area Library has a tremendous staff. I'm just like so many of you have said, I think that they are just, just great in the services and the way they uh, treat every person that enters the library. Chase, can you repeat the question, please? Mm -hmm. Does the library board have a role in selecting library books, publications, online materials, or programs? And if so, what is that role? Oh, I believe from what I read on the, the Illinois Library Association, it was, it's more so the library di director and the staff that is more involved with the selection process. And then when it comes to the board, it's more, more up the scale of if someone were to come and like file a complaint or something, then it moves up those, that line of, of, you know, going through the staff, going through the director. And uh, within the past three years, I've been through the minutes and I've said in the past several months of library board meetings nobody's ever come and actually challenged the book so as far as that process it's more us uh, library board members just voting on policy that is discussed and you know advocating for the library and selecting a director that is in charge of those types of things and kind of watching you know going along with the perform his performance and so far everything's been great but yes i hope that cleared things up okay clears things up thanks Rachel? I have to agree as far as, you know, the, the library trustee's primary responsibility is to hire the director, approve the budget, and be the conduit between the community and the and the board, I mean, and the, and the library staff. So it's really up to the library director and the staff to do the selection. They're, they're the, you know, they're trained and they have a lot more experience. And um, as, far, as far as programming, I think if we, if the board has some kind of ideas that, from the the library director has always been like the Vicky, the previous one, and the and Jason, our current library director, have always been very open to suggestions, and they're very nimble. I think they are eager. If if people have if there's a need and there's a want and people have an interest, that they're they're game. All right, Kristen. Um, yeah, I kind of have to agree with everyone. Um, the library director is pretty much in charge of selecting the programming and the books. Um, you know, we oversee the financing. Um, so I guess as a patron, you could say, I want to see more hard copy books or something. Um, but yeah, I think it's just kind of a balanced relationship. And I've met with Jason, our current library director, and he is extremely open to ideas and any feedback or, you know, community members looking for certain programs. Um, I, I think it's the board's job to work with the library director and I guess support them in, in what we're trying to accomplish. All right, Lindsay. So most of the actual decision-making on the programs, the materials, I, that is on the staff that has been hired to do their jobs using the degrees that they've gotten in library studies, in children's programming, in other literary fields, people that we have hired to do these jobs. As the board, it is our job to hire the executive director who oversees those things. And so uh, Jason has stepped into that role recently. And so far from what I've seen from him, he's done a fantastic job. But our role as the board is to be the voice for the community. So if the community is saying, hey, we need more books in foreign languages to help support our dual language uh, kids in school, or hey, we need a, a beautiful overhead book scanner it's our job to voice that, to work with Jason, to guide our community members. Hey, you can send an email. And if there's a book that the library doesn't have and they can't get it on intro loan, you can recommend that. We need, yeah, okay. Um, and Kelly. Thanks, Lori. I'm gonna echo Lindsay's last comment there. And again, um, the comments of all the colleagues couldn't agree more. We've done an exceptional job. Um, Jason is doing a terrific job as our executive director. It is the board's 
of trustees responsibility, again, from a fiduciary standpoint to advance the investment, but also to ensure governance. Um, and as that as a function related and enabling an environment that the staff can make the right choices. Um, it's really up to us to help drive, again, the government, the frontline, assisting the frontline team members in order to do that. Ultimately, um, also at risk of duplication, um, acting as the voice of the community. So while it's up to us to be the conduit to the community and to take in uh, interest, at the end of the day, it's really up to the uh, staff and to create this customer and community driven um, approach in that way. Okay, no rebuttals yet. Okay, we'll go on to the next. Number six, and we are back to Chase being the first respondent. Would you support adopting written policies and procedures to address a patron's challenge to a book that the board has approved? And if not, how would you handle a request to remove a book from the shelves? Again, that when that challenged, it should go exactly directly to the director, Jason. Even if it was, say, we any of us became a trustee and that complaint was filed to us, it goes to the director and we have the procedures and policies that are already in place that they follow the steps. Um, the libraries are protected by the First Amendment, right? They make that very clear in all of you know this Illinois state, local, county, everything. This is a, it's freedom of speech. Um, <laughs> sorry, I lost my train of thought for a second. But it's the First Amendment right. It's in our constitution. And uh, I believe in community members to make those decisions for themselves and, and respect other patrons for you know having different opinions and not wanting to take away what people may want to read for themselves, even if you alone have a problem with it. Rachel? Can you read the, the question one more time? Absolutely. Would you support adopting written policies and procedures to address a patron's challenge to a book that the board has approved? And if not, how would you handle a request to remove a book from the shelves? Okay, that's why that's I thought. Um, well, I, we actually, so we do have a written um, uh, set of policy on what to do for a challenge. And it definitely aligns itself with the, what's suggested by the American Library Association and the standard of Illinois Public Library. So we're, we're right on sync, pretty much what, what Chase was saying, that it's it's a First Amendment right. And we and when someone does make a challenge, uh, oftentimes when a, a, the first step is for one of our librarians to you know, talk to the customer and find out what their concerns are and after having a conversation, oftentimes it, it, that's where we we agree to disagree, and there hasn't gone hasn't been escalated up the up the chain. And I think that's the way it should be. We we nobody there's there's a great line. I think Kristen and I don't want to steal your line, but you know a great library has something to offend everyone. There's the, and where so where do we draw the line? And I, I we we share that. I hope I didn't steal your line. That's okay. Okay. I'm still my line. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Kristen, you're up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like Rachel said, a great library has something to offend everyone. Um, I I think in the case of a library, those are sources of information. Um, you know, we don't ban books from libraries. Uh, it doesn't matter if you like it or you don't. It's the First Amendment, freedom of speech. Um, I think everyone should have access to information and I don't think you should take books out. I, I believe there is policies in place, but we don't ban books um, and I support that. Lindsay. So one of the, I will echo what Rachel said, we already have a written policy and procedure in place at the Barrington Area Library to address patrons' concerns with books. As a library, it is our job, the library's job to provide open access to information and resources and resist censorship. That is ingrained in the library as a public service. And I fully support that if a book has been 
adapted for our library. It has followed the wishes of our, our voices of our community, the things that our community has expressed interest in, and that it should remain on the shelf. And I fully support the current process as it stands for the library. Okay. Kelly? Again, at risk of duplication, I agree. I agree with a lot of the comments that have been shared. The policy is in place, and it's up to us to ensure that the procedure that has been in place for years is upheld and that we're supporting the staff and, again, being the voice of the community. Um, I believe that the Illinois Library Association is working with legislators now in Springfield to block book bans in libraries, which is important. Laura, you had made a comment about um, a, a, a rebuttal or to that end. Um, agree. I, I, I'll say personally, Kelly Dittman, as a candidate, I do not believe in banning books. I do not think that that is um, something that is, uh, as a trustee, within our um, jurisdiction. And so the censorship is not not okay. And it's up to us as board members to work in a collaborative manner to make sure that we're aligning the advancing the policy procedures and priorities in a way that are commensurate with the community expectations. Jackie? Yeah, there is a definite um, policy regarding uh, what the library and their policy calls a reconsideration of materials. And it's a step-by-step -step process that involves the patron who has a concern about a book, and it goes all the way through written request into the um, executive director, and then it is given within a certain time frame to the board, and they do make an ultimate decision on whether the book would, or any material, not just a book, but any of the things that are happening in the library need to be um, you know, removed or um, changed or what have you. So, and, and it says in the policy handbook uh, itself, the determination of the board shall be final. So that's why being a member of the board is so important. And um, I'm very happy to see that all the other candidates um, share my feelings about book banning and what's happening in our country today in that regard. All right. Um, this next question will start with Rachel. Which of the measures that the library has taken have been most effective at keeping the library's patrons safe? Are there any that you would eliminate, change, or add? To start with, I think one of the best things they've done or one of the best, it, well, is sending the kids section off to the side where they're kind of, you just, you, you go, you don't have to go through a lot of adult material to get to the kids section. So the kids section is, is pretty contained. I like, I like that aspect of the library. One thing that I think we could do better uh, and, and, and especially in highlight in recent events, what happened with the 4th of July shooting we need to have an emergency plan in place. So possibly work with the police department to come and do a, a, a look around and come up with suggestions and, and procedures and what to follow and how to train our staff uh, in case in there, there's an emergency safety um, situation like that. Kristen? Um, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm not really Sure, I haven't really thought about um, the safety as far as anything specific. Um, I always think of Barrington as such a safe town and I, I guess I know with the 4th of July shooting, you can't always expect that, but um, I do think that Rachel's correct and that the kids area is that back bar, that's a good thing. Um, that's something I guess I would have to think more about Okay, Lindsay. One of the things that I think is essential in case of an emergency, um, such as what Rachel had mentioned, are if you look at our library entrance as you come in, there are two sets of doors. Um, our schools are now all set up very similarly, where you can um, you can lock 
somebody if you would need to into that section before they come in. Um, they don't auto lock, but having having multiple ways to slow down somebody coming into an area, I think is essential. Uh, Rachel had mentioned the having a plan. Um, I believe that making sure that we work with our other community public works, so the village, our local police, our local fire department, to ensure that they are involved in those plans and have annual practices, annual reviews um, of those plans in place so that all the library staff um, are aware. Kelly. This is a great, this is a great one. And I think we should have some more time. We should add it to the long range planning. <laughs> I just had this conversation today. I was sharing with the ladies before we joined the call, you know, resiliency and sustainability go hand in hand. And I think that this is an interesting conversation because um, again, not being on the trustee board currently, but now doing some research, I think in order for us to put together the resiliency, I think Rachel mentioned it on the onset, the resiliency plans in place, uh, wellness, health, um, you know, making sure that we're anticipating those kind of acute uh, disaster recovery, things of those nature. COVID is a great example of that. So making sure that we're creating this environment that can still thrive um, in, in agnostic to, you know, what might come across um, from a disaster planning standpoint. So great, great question. Okay, Jackie. Yeah, I agree with Kelly. I think this is a great question. And being an educator and spending um, my career in schools, of course, and, and all of you did too. So you're all aware that you had the tornado drills, you had the fire drills, and your younger people and myself as an educator, we had the active shooter drills. And they have been improved over and over throughout the, you know, and, throughout the years, all of them. And uh, all of our schools, you see, are, are better equipped to deal with any, um, you know, active shooter or threats to our children and, and, you know, in regards to the entrance and, you know, having to have security, all kinds of different ways. I'm not sure what the library has in that regard. I'm not sure that they ever had to have um, evacuation for a fire or a tornado or any of those things. So I think that is a great question and one that should be, um, you know, looked into by the board members and take some action on, especially in today's, you know, climate and the world we live in, unfortunately. All right, and Chase. Yeah, so I'm gonna echo a little bit of uh, Kelly, Jackie, and Lindsay. Absolutely, the, when you first posed the question, I was wondering safety, okay, which, which safety, like physical violence or, you know, viruses or, you know, or environmental crises, like which which one? But that's a great idea on on in regards to getting third party, you know, uh, local police to come in and evaluate. Depending on depending on what we're planning for, but to have a long term plan in regards to the library of of emergency response, depending on what the emergency is, I think is a great great thing to do in all public spaces. So that's something I would definitely like to look at for sure. Okay, so the next question, we'll start with Kristen. What are your ideas for making sure the library is able to meet the needs of its diverse, diverse community? Um, well, I know actually when I just sat down with Jason, um, the library director, so I, um, I weekly work at um, Gigi's Playhouse. I do this LMNOP class from ages zero to three. And it's a, um, it's a place for all ages for people with Down syndrome. And one of the things that I hear the most from the families is that they really need some place or event sometimes where it's just kids with Down syndrome because even if it's mixed, um, with kids that don't have any disabilities, it can be really overwhelming for them. Um, just in general, I think, you know, I talked to Jason about having maybe like once a month or just every once in a while something just for like a specific group. Like, I mean, I, I guess because I work with the Down syndrome. Um, sorry, my time's up. Yeah, time's up. <laughs> sorry. Okay, Lindsay. 
I think you're muted. Thank you so much. Technology sometimes works against us. <laughs> so I, there are two things that come to mind uh, with that question. One um, that I recently looked into was expanding the offerings that we have in books in foreign languages. When I say that, I'm not talking learn how to speak Spanish, learn how to speak Mandarin. Actual books that are in those languages for advanced readers. In our library currently, there are less than 100 books that are available in Spanish and in Mandarin for adults to read. We do have a growing diversity of persons in the Barrington area. And so being able to offer books in foreign languages, especially for our dual language kids that are coming up, um, I think would be a great asset and a way to give back to our community in many different areas, regardless of age of our members. Kelly. You bet, well said. When I think about uh, the, the when I think about the question, outreach and partnership is, is key from a cultural perspective, ensuring that we have an inclusive environment, uh, making sure that we've got community-based organizations represented, uh, and quite frankly, leveraging some of the communication channels to ensure uh, like social media and for promoting some of the offerings the library has. Again, um, I think, you know, COVID's a, an easy one because it was, you know, a shock to so many different systems and environments, whether it was professionally or in schools or with our assets like the library. So being able to create this open environment physically and then also virtually, like we talked about before, I also think um, I was doing a little bit of research. It was interesting. The library uh, ranks in the top 6% of the nation on electronic and circulation, inclusive of different uh, uh, materials available to everyone. And so I think that that's another uh, showcase is how the library's done really a terrific job in helping to create that inclusive environment. Jackie? Okay, well, I agree with what Lindsay said, you know, being an educator and working with, um, you know, students around um, different backgrounds and cultures and ESL children, and um, I'm almost shocked to hear there's only 100 uh, Spanish uh, books in our library with a huge number of books that we have and I don't even know what, what we have in the way of um, DVDs, CDs and other audio books in that regard. And maybe that's something that needs to be, you know, looked at a little bit more closely. And the other thing that um, I would suggest, and again, this has to go in with outreach, and some of you have mentioned that, into our um, areas that are underserved, uh, perhaps doing more of our like story programs and uh, that we have for um, children that are, you know, come with their docents into the libraries and their parents and they live, maybe they live close or, you know, they have more access to that. But there are a lot of families that live in the outlying areas that don't have maybe transportation or, you know, the children during the summertime are being um, you know, with younger <laughs> children at home. So anyway, that's me. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Chase. Yes, absolutely. I'm again echoing some of my colleagues. The, the foreign language issue was huge for me. Um, like I said, I went to Greencastle and I spoke with people in that community, many Chinese speakers, many Russian speakers. And one of the one of the things that they had asked me is, hey, can we get more books in our language? And it it was like a shock, you know? And then I came to the realization that even the, the Barrington Area Library website is only in English. So not only do, do they not really have access to material in their own language, but they can't even navigate the website and understand what resources the library even has to offer, right? So that was a huge thing for me as well. I mean, I went on and looked at, for example, romance fiction, 99, over 9,900 books in English, only 13 in Polish, four in Spanish, three in Italian. And that just was down the line, whatever you're looking up in genres. And same on the Libby app, same with the audiobooks, same with the DVDs. And I was just kind of heartbroken when I was asked that simple question of, hey, like, hey, can I have more things in my language for me to read. Thank you. All right, and Rachel. Hi, so in my previous uh, community in Dedham, one of our biggest languages speakers were um, were Greek. And we, we actually had a big uh, initiative one year to actually increase 
our Greek collection. And I think it's very, it's really good to be responsive to the people who are in your community and make sure you're providing for them. Uh, one thing that someone um, pointed out to me that they like to see that they saw at the Arlington Heights Memorial Library was um, more of a uh, items for kids with special needs and sensory issues. Because kids, you don't know what is going to work for your one particular kid. There are like all kinds of tools and equipment and resources, and, and parents can't afford to buy all these things just to try, you know, to find out it doesn't work for their kid. So one thing that the Arlington Library does is that you can take out these items, you can take out a chair, you can take out um, like you know, different fidget things and see what works for your kid before you purchase it. So I think that would be an interesting thing if we can. They, and they did it through um, a partnership and through donations. They did it very affordably. <gasps> Okay, the next question is going to go to Lindsay first. How would you rate the Barrington Library's financial condition? What steps do you believe need to be taken to maintain a strong library for the community? And how would you pay for them uh, if additional funding is needed? I believe that the library is in a great position financially. We have a very well balanced budget. Our rainy day fund is funded and within the guidelines um, for how that is funded. Um, as far as if we needed additional funding, the way that our budget is currently set up, we have the ability to, we have a buffer space. Um, it's very similar to somebody buying a house for the first time. You wouldn't tell them not to put some money away for when the roof needs replaced. But you also wouldn't tell them not to put money away for the emergencies when your dishwasher blows up and there's water all over the place and and now you need a new dishwasher and some new flooring. Um, and so I think the library has positioned itself very well financially and I would be excited to slide right in um, and continue to maintain the excellent financial budgeting that we've done. Kelly. Yeah, I agree with Lindsay. I think that um, one of our main areas of focus as candidates is to promote fiscal responsibility and transparency. The library has done a tremendous job of um, allocating resources. They have, um, I think, of almost upwards of a 25 million net position. Uh, and so having those funds on hand and an ability to start thinking about I think that the right resources are starting to spend time now on long-term planning, thinking about investment, where that allocation. Or I believe in your question was also around um, with additional funding, right? If we were to raise additional capital or such. Um, one, of the, um, one of the brainstorming sessions within the trustee group was around foundation planning. And again, I think the overall arching group has done a good job of spending time thinking about best in class, what other libraries are doing as well. So in summary, very um, well-funded net position. I think there's an opportunity for us to think strategically on how we're going to advance some of those investments and ultimately um, uh, make sure that uh, um, time is that commensurate with the community. Thank you. Jackie. Yeah, I think the Barrington Area Library, because of its large geographic area, is in a, a very unique position, especially much different from the uh, library that I was a board uh, trustee at. It was, uh, you know, encompassed just a, the um, the village itself. Our library uh, goes across four counties, and um, you know the tax levy is set at five percent. Uh, once you reach that, if you wanted to increase it, you'd have to go to a referendum, and collecting the uh, the money from the different counties can be a bit challenging, as I found out. During a, a period with Cook County, they were not able to um, um, give their tax uh, money to our library for a period of time. They offered a loan to our library. And um, fortunately, because our library does a really good job fiscally, they didn't need to take that loan. They were able to keep their operating um, expenses and meet their uh, payments and keep continuing the fine job that it does. So um, I think our library is doing a good job. Chase. Can you repeat the full question? Sure. Uh, how would you rate Barrington Library's financial condition? What steps do you believe need to be taken to maintain a strong library for the community? And how would you pay for them if additional funding is needed? 
Right now, I think the financially the library is in like exceedingly great uh, standing. Um, we have, you know, obviously a ton of operational costs, but we have a lot um, in in the reserves as well. Um, I think before asking for more money, we definitely need to have that long term strategic plan. I think it's it's very essential to to justify uh, where when you ask for money, justify why you're asking for that money and where, where it's going to go. I think a lot of people would feel very comfortable like, oh, okay, you're asking for this money. It's because it's going to go to this program, this program, this program, and you're going to have an influx of all of these resources. Um, sorry, that was like a three-part question. Um, the, yeah. Um, if, oh, as far as getting more funding, there are many ways to advocate for more funny, uh, funding, even like um, writing to legislation, just advocating and telling local um, government about what we need, the, what the library needs. All right. Rachel. Uh, so Jackie took my Thank point you. about Cook County being late, right. but I was really happy to Thank see you. that our library has a buffer in place because you can't, you just, to Lindsay's point, you can't just rely on everything running perfectly all the time. So I think we are positioned really well financially. Um, Illinois' tax system is crazy back, back backwards. I, I coming from Massachusetts, it's it's, it's very eye opening, and I can see how it'd be really frustrating for people to follow. Uh, but I think what our our library is particularly very well run as far as they can they invest regularly and sustainably. You have to do it every single year, because if you have a dip one year, it, it, it just feeds off itself in future years. You just have to have that, that, that level of continuous support. And I've been a part of a library in Massachusetts that, that fell off that. We had to go to a finance committee every single year, and we almost lost our state accreditation, which also meant we also lost our state funding. So it's so important to stay on track every year. All right, and Kristen. Um, I would say that our library's finances are, um, I mean, they're definitely funded completely. Um, usually the budget's about 8.2 million and it seems historically they spend about 6.9 million. They have 11 million in reserve, um, but I think their policy states that they normally keep six to 12 months um, at the most, which would be about 8 million. So currently we're about three million over what the 12 year um, reserve that they normally would keep. So I would say, you know, I, I think the board just voting to raise the taxes, I would rather see a long-term plan put in place for the money um, before trying to collect more money when they already have a reserve and a buffer. Um, I, I think the long-term planning is key, but I think we're very financially sound. All right. Next question, we'll start with Kelly. I would like to rebuttal or use my, Sure. I would like to use my 30 seconds, please. Okay. Um, so just to um, sort of uh, go off of what Kristen had mentioned with the $11 million, our library obviously didn't spend a whole lot during COVID because we, didn't have those in-person programs. There was a lot of extra funds there. That money is being put back into the additions that we weren't able to complete during that time. Um, as well as if you think about the last year and how much inflation has gone up, inflation has gone up almost more than double what the levy that we even asked for was. And so I think we're gonna need those funds to offset the inflation costs that are continuing to happen. And I had to, I'd like Rachel, to use did, did you want to? Okay. I, I'll have one too. Okay. In addition to what Lindsay was saying, there is also extra money there that was put aside uh, waiting to, once the, the new road is put through with the Route 14 and, and all that, what's going on with the village. So they have had money sitting and waiting to do the parking lot over in anticipation of what's going to happen after all that work is done. So it's not that it's just sitting there you know, for no purpose, it has a purpose. There's the, the project has been put off and we just have to wait until the village is finished doing their part. All right, Kristen. Um, so to the point about inflation, that's the thing. I mean, inflation's hitting everyone. 
So to have all of that money just sitting there when they're, you know, maybe not everyone, but there are a lot of families that they could have really used to keep that extra money um, that they just got raised and increased because a lot of the property values were increased. So the library was already going to get a little extra money from that. So to add the levy on top of it, um, you know, I know some families that are struggling and you can't really eat books, which I mean, I want our library well-funded, but they could have used that money too during inflation. Okay. Anyone else want to say something? <laughs> All right. We're going to move along. And uh, I think this will probably be our last question, and then we will move to, uh, to closing statements. So this one starts with Kelly. Many libraries have been publicly approached at meetings by interested persons in the community who advocate for various rights and freedoms as it relates to access to information, free press, and free speech. Please share your perspective on how board members should weigh the varying input they receive from the community and how those factors will impact your decision and policy making. Yeah, at risk of um, being a little long-winded, um, I believe that it's it's an it's an incumbent on the library board as a group to make sure that you're taking inputs from the community or different places, media, other different channels, and really balancing in a collaborative way to make sure that there's consensus and alignment in any type of. Um, uh, response again on behalf of the asset itself, the library. I also believe that it's very important to ensure that we have the um, again we're in a government's capa governance capacity as a board. So it's important that we um, empower and enable our our team members and our executive director to uh, you know take the lead and to drive those communication channels. Okay, Jackie. Oh, good question. I kind of, I really do agree with Kelly and um, what she said about, um, you know, uh, the, the board's responsibility would try to address this, but to build a consensus in its response so that they are showing that um, they are united in the way that they are addressing these concerns of um, the different uh, patrons and organizations within the community itself. Okay. Chase. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah. Many libraries have been publicly approached at meetings by interested persons in the community who advocate for various rights and freedoms as it relates to access to information, to free press and free speech. Please share your perspective on how board members should weigh the varying input they receive from the community and how those factors will impact your decision and policy making. Um, to me, this sounds similar to like the, you know, a censorship question, like, do they have access to freedom of speech? Uh, and, and I'm trying to, to me, that question is phrased a little funny, but um, again, it's the First Amendment right, uh, pre constitution, if you want access to any materials or, or um, no censorship. I apologize. I'm not sure if I'm in like understanding the question clearly, but but um, for example, I was, uh, I've heard before that there was a, a case where there was a problem with books being not given to the, through the interlibrary request loan um, because of, they were deemed misinformation. And I think that it's freedom of free, uh, speech, freedom of press, people should have access to any materials that they, they wish to have. Okay, Rachel? I agree, uh, Chase, that it, it's very similar to the question that we already had in some ways, um, that we all said that we strongly believe that it, we have to hold the line that everyone has for the, for the freedom to read and people have the, the rights to, to, to choose what they want to read. And I think we also have to remind people that we all have the responsibility as readers to choose not to read a book if we don't want to, or we read a book and we it's okay to disagree. You know, books are not prescriptive, they're reflective. They, you know, you just, as you read something doesn't mean you're going, you know, a lot of people read American Psycho and no, you know, we didn't have this whole wave of serial killers going on. It's just, so it's all very subjective. And I think we seem to be more in alignment than not on this question. Okay, Kristen? Um, yeah, I mean, I believe in freedom of speech and 
especially in a library, your freedom for information, that's what it's there for. Um, it's the one place where everyone in every tax bracket can go and get the exact same knowledge. So I don't think we should be withholding that from anyone. Um, I think. Okay, Lindsay. So First Amendment rights, uh, library, our entire job is to be able to provide open access to information for people and to resist censorship. I believe that the voice of the community is still important to hear, uh, regardless of what they have to say, because First Amendment rights and our job is to also listen to the community and um, to be reflective of, of what their wants um, and their wishes are. I also think it is our job to educate on what our role is as a trustee uh, to the public and to our community, and also what is the role of a public library. So, thank you. Okay, time now requires that we move to closing statements. So candidates, you will each have one minute and we will begin with Jackie McGrath. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this very important forum this evening. There, as I said in my opening statement, uh, unfortunately, there is a nationwide um, movement to, um, you know, ban books and change, uh, cut budgets and materials and programs at library and change their library policies. And I think this is why this election is so important. Who sits on a board will determine the Barrington Area Library's future. All right, Chase Heidner. Uh, I just want to say thank you so much for having me and for everybody that's listening. I really appreciate your time and everybody um, being involved in local politics and getting to know the candidates. I'm here because I love the library and I want to make it the best place. I want to make it a staple in Barrington. Um, and I think that I am capable of doing that. A large part of my educational and, and professional career allowed me the opportunities to work on teams, to work collaboratively collaboratively with my teammates and to amplify you know their knowledge skills and abilities that they bring so I, I would definitely want to work on a, a team of board members with all the same mission goal to make the library a, a place for every community community member want that wants to go with resources that are provided for community members of all walks of life that are seeking any type of information so yes again I believe that at the center of every strong community is their library and I promise that I will be a strong advocate for our library. And I hope to earn your vote come April 4th. Thank you. Rachel Forsyth Turk. Thank you, Lori, and thank you to the League. Uh, as I've said before, I've been a strong library advocate for the past 18 years, including four years as a library trustee in Massachusetts. Uh, my interest in libraries is not something new. I've been passionate about keeping public libraries vibrant and current with the communities they serve, as well as advocating for the freedom to read. Uh, I would love the opportunity to help promote services and programs that we already offer, but many folks don't always know about, uh, like the browsing bundles and the author visits. Uh, as a library trustee, I would seek opportunities to create, create connections with neighbors through community-wide social events. Uh, the library does a great job partnering with nonprofit organizations, and I think there's some opportunity to continue similar work with the schools, the village, the local businesses. I have experience doing that kind of work previously as a library trustee, and I'd be happy to continue it to be here in, in Barrington. Uh, again, my name is Rachel Forsyth Turk, and I'm asking for your vote for Barrington Area Library Trustee on or before April 4th. Thank you. Kristen Cunningham. Um, so I wanna just say, um, a quote from Sydney Sheldon, that libraries store the energy that fuels imagination. They open up windows to the world and inspire us to explore and achieve and contribute to improving our quality of life. Libraries change lives for the better. Um, I just wanna be a part of the library. Um, I wanna be a part of the fiscal responsibility, the patron experience, um, advocating, community outreach, um, I just think outreach being number one, um, just kind of spread the word about the library. And I hope you choose me on April 4th. Lindsay Priggy. The Barrington Public Library District strives to stimulate imagination, 
develop information fluency, foster lifelong learning, and create young readers for all in a comfortable and physical for in a comfortable physical and virtual setting. This is the library's mission statement. So after this forum, I encourage everyone to go and research all of the candidates. Um, thank you all for being here this evening. It was lovely to hear um, everybody come together and get everyone's uh, views on these questions. And really just ask yourself, do you, are the candidates that I am choosing to vote for going to uphold that, that mission? So please go out. Early voting starts on March 20th. Election day is April 4th. Um, and I would be absolutely delighted to represent our community on the library board. Thank you. And Kelly Dittman. You bet. Thank you, Lori and Kathy to the League of Women Voters. It's an honor to be here. Kelly Dittman running for the two year ticket for library board, committed to Barrington, committed to our community and have a strong passion for education and bringing folks together. As a library enthusiast, I promise to be an advocate for the mission, bringing my expertise in business to the table. We believe in creating that excellence in the patron experience, driving resources and policies reflective of community values, and ultimately driving that fiscal responsibility and transparency. It's an honor to be your candidate, and I look forward to your vote in April. All right. So as we bring this forum to a close, I want, first of all, to thank all the candidates for their participation. As a league, we love having participants uh, that are running for offices. And uh, so I, I really appreciated this opportunity to, uh, to listen to all of you. You've got a great bunch of candidates and I really have to visit your library. It sounds wonderful. <laughs> and I love libraries too, by the way. We'd like to encourage all our candidates to recycle their campaign signs. Members of the public can do this as well please visit the LWV Palatine Area website at www.lwvpalatineareaorg for details. If you're not a registered voter, you can find registration information on our website as well. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, thank you all for coming and don't forget, early voting begins on March 22nd, but you said 20th, is it 20th? 20th. 20th. There's plenty of election material available on the League of Information, League of Women Voters website. Please participate in our democracy by casting your ballot and your vote is your voice. All right, this brings it to a close. Thank you all so much. And thank, thank you, you so much for, uh, for, for listening in on this. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank, thank you. you.